I wanted to um, say what I'm doing now, which fits into what you'll be doing. Since 1997, I've worked as a freelance editor, uh, and my specialty is working with authors who have written books that they're trying to get published, fiction and nonfiction. So I work with the person one-on-one, -on -one, read the manuscript, correct all the grammar, punctuation, sentence structure kinds of things, but also make larger suggestions about how the author can improve his or her work, you know, amplify certain areas, move things around, change the things, uh, in order to create the best possible manuscript yep. that he or she can. Yeah. And that's what mm -hmm. John and I do yeah. together because since, oh gosh, what was it, 87, we've worked together yeah. on um, articles for, uh, for a monthly column on economics for the Detroit and Oakland County Legal News. So John does the initial draft, Drafts, drafts plural, plural, and then he gives them to me, and then I edit them and make suggestions, and, and together go, then we... We have a process of you. We, we can talk yeah. about that yeah, later. We can. We, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it, it, it works. Um, no, uh, he also does some other really cool things, like um, was it University of Detroit Law School when they were yeah. up for reaccreditation? They had to come up with all this stuff from everybody, and he's the one who put it together. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was an interesting time. Yeah, yeah. it was like but, you know, uh, like five dissertations combined or something. It was, it yeah. was, but but it worked, and they they got their accreditation. Yeah. So that was what counts. Yeah. So today, what I want to do is to work with John in talking about how you as writers can bring your work up to the professional level because you'll be writing your term papers for this class but rather than just creating a document that you turn in and that's it what we are hoping to achieve is for you to create something that can be used beyond this class something that you can use in your professional career the, the tools and suggestions that I'm going to be giving you. This is, this is going to bounce. And oh, okay. I won't. I won't make any emph no. emphatic okay. moves. Okay. So, um, the tools and su suggestions that we're going to be giving you, and I specifically on the writing, are things that you can apply to your paper, which will help to make it as good as it can be, which will give you that definitive edge, the professional edge over your colleagues. So in other words, you can have this document and you might be able to use it when you go to apply for a job. You can use it in your workplace because they often ask for writing samples. You can use this and I can guarantee you it will be better than 99.9% .9 of co your colleagues will be, uh, will be doing the same thing because you're going to have this information yeah. to draw on. Uh, and what we, I'm seeing is that it almost seems inverse with some of the universities that the more yeah. highly, highly regarded the university, sometimes the worse the writing. Yeah, it's true. You know, yeah. I figure if you're spending like forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year on tuition, you should learn how to write better, but apparently... That's yeah. not what's happening for whatever reason, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So. Well, there's been kind of a downgrading in, yeah. in, in some ways, yeah. just in general, in our culture. You know, the whole, um, you know, journalistic thing, you know, where split infinitives are allowed and sentence, sentence fragments are allowed and all the things that 50 years ago weren't allowed are now mm -hmm. allowed and that's what's what's um, being reflected. So. Then, you know, child left behind, no teacher left behind, uh, because if a teacher didn't test, uh, teach to the test, they would get fired. Exactly. So I and, and other people who have been teaching for a while have seen just a, a steady decline on average, not so much at the upper levels, because if you made it this far, probably you're you're a lot better than average, but like at the sophomore level, and that, it's, that's a good indicator, and it's just a decrease in writing ability, a decrease in critical thinking, which is mm -hmm. pandemic. Exactly. Yeah. That's a very good way to put it. So our point here then is to give you 
the tools to get to let you write a paper that gets a good grade in this class but also one with which you can enhance your professional reputation. So with that being said, let's, let's get into writing the term papers. So what you are going to do with your term paper is to choose a topic from the field of money and banking and then to do extensive research on it and then write about it in an informed manner that also shows your enthusiasm for your subject. Because the point is, you have chosen the topic out of the plethora of topics out there on money and banking. You've chosen something that really appeals to you. So what you want to do with your paper is to show that you really know what you're talking about in the paper, but also that, you're, that you're, you really think it's cool, that you really liked it, and that you want to impart that enthusiasm to John, to me, and to whomever else reads your paper. I, so, I, I have Gary read all the papers with me. And I, I do the grading, but he contributes a lot in terms of introspection and uh, review and marking up on things and so you know, lots of red ink goes to, to the process. Right, right, right. Well, the point of the term paper is that this is a document that is sophisticated, is full of good information, that goes into detail, and that makes it different than your PowerPoint presentation. The PowerPoint presentation, you want to hit the highlights of what you covered in your term paper and present those highlights in a visually arresting manner. But the PowerPoint presentation isn't the same as the term paper. And that's where a lot of people fall down because they think it's the same and they turn a, ter a term paper that's just very, very basic and that doesn't say Into much. A slide you meant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, now we, we have talked um, a fair amount so far about the presentation, seen some examples, good. and the problems of bad PowerPoint presentations that many of us have sat through in either classroom or in work situations. There's, there's an appreciation of, of this. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so what we're looking for in going through your term papers is you're writing about your topics in an original, clear, and concise manner, and you convince your readers that you are knowledgeable about your subject and impassioned about it. So that's it in a nutshell. That's what we're looking for. So once you've chosen your subject, what do you do? The first thing that you do is you do your research. Mm -hmm. And once you've done your research and you know what you want to write about, you, you organize the information. And what I would suggest is to go with the three section headings that you have, the introduction, the development and the summary conclusion and earmark the points that fit into each of those categories and then use what is called the inverted pyramid approach to organize them. And what that is, just imagine a, a triangle, you know, a pyramid and turn it upside down. So the, the widest point is at the top and then it scales down to the smallest. Kind of like a funnel. Yeah, like a funnel. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good analogy. Yeah. So what you want to do is take the most important information, put that at the top, and then go down to the, the lesser, through the lesser important things. So that's, that's what you want to do for each section. Well, you know, some thesis statement or a paragraph, you know, topic statement, whatever you want to call yeah. it. And also, in terms of, you know, the voice, Yes. Doing this, which is sort of like you know, a meta issue. Um, you know, we had this discussion of like um, who, what, who said was it Lee Wei Lee, Lee said, "Don't write like an economist." Yeah, he told us, "Don't write like an economist, or don't write like a lawyer." Okay. Whatever you write a voice. 
tell him, you know, mm-hmm. we have a casual conversation. Hmm. Yeah. That's how he went to the papers for his class. Yeah. However, however, well say is that because you're basically upper division seniors and grad students in economics and or closely related fields, you think in these concepts and terms and your vocabulary is ingrained with the vocabulary of economies. So you're not going to get away from it. Yeah, see this class would be different. That's, Jordan, that's just, that's, yeah, it's, it's just, just going to be yourself. We had you. Yeah, your you self is coming out. Technology for the money and banking. Mm-hmm. Like the stuff, well, when we had, uh, when we were doing stuff for, um, for antitrust, mm-hmm. so that was kind of easier to break down into regular language because it really didn't use all yeah. the terms. Because it was like the stuff for Microsoft, AT and T. It really didn't have, yeah, or market maximization and stuff like that, or profit maximization in it. It mm-hmm. actually talked about easier stuff in it, so you could talk about it yeah. in your regular voice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, you can use your regular voice, but your regular voice in this area of economics is going to sound, it's going to sound, going to sound you don't like have to economy. try to sound yeah. like an economist because you well, are, end up, end up and like you're actually going to try and do the opposite of like, if I talk like an economist, like I talk with my, my, my friends, my colleagues, no one else is going to understand what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> I, get, I get this from my wife all the time, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, how can I explain this so it, it is you know, more widely interpretable? The, a good rule of thumb with this is think about your grandma. You know, yes. could, if you talked about this subject to your, with your grandmother, what would you say? Assuming kind of that she doesn't use. have a doctor in that context. Right, yeah, yeah. That's the idea, that you, you don't want to just expect that whomever is reading your paper knows about your particular subject. Yeah. You, want to, you want to explain it thoroughly to mm-hmm. them. So with, that, without pandering. Oh, yeah, without, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. No, you want to keep it but you, you want at to make, a level, you want to make professional. It because even in the field of economics, you know, we have some terminology in one subfield, the term is used a little bit different than it is in another subfield. You know, that's just the way it is. It, it, and it, it can be very convoluted. So, you know, defining your terms succinctly or, you, or in context of how it's used that the person reading it is going to understand. In kind of the, um, the flesh Kincaid <coughs> test, how many people are familiar with the flesh Kincaid reading level measure? Um, yeah. Google. and there's a couple other systems like this, where it looks at the number of words in the sentence, the number of syllables, and some other things, and allows you to rank it as, oh, this is reading for a 15-year-old, which is very interesting mm-hmm. because um, somebody did analysis of the, the new Harley-Davidson ads and they're all geared to a 15-year-old level, which tells you something who their, their focus market is on this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the high school yeah. graduate, uh, level of college, college graduate, uh, slash graduate student, right? You, know, you, you want to get like in that level, which is college graduate, first year grad student level, right? right. John mentioned a minute ago thesis sentences and that is what we would suggest that you use in your papers in your introduction because your introduction you're going to be telling 
the person reading your paper what he or she will be encountering in the whole paper. So you're, you're laying it out for them. And the thesis sentences really help you to do that. You would say something like, in this paper, comma, I will explain how, blah, blah, blah. In this paper, comma, I will demonstrate. Something like that. An abstract. Yes. You pick up, you know, open up any one of the, you know, professional journals, and they usually will have an abstract of the article. It's a long article. Read through some of them. So you know, find some of the better ones. Better right there. And, and see how it's basically encapsulates everything that the, the long paper is about, which exactly. means it's easier to determine, uh, okay, uh, this is not really related to what I'm doing, so I'll move on. It's like, oh yeah, this is good. I'm going to look at this more, right? The, the abstract is more than just the cover, right? It's kind of like, it's a glimpse, in, a holistic glimpse into what the, what the paper is. Good. Let me give you a couple of examples of thesis sentences. Here's one. In this paper, comma, I will show how the government of the city of Detroit has misused its funds during the Kilpatrick administration, thus leading to the city's bankruptcy. So that says exactly what the paper is going to include, and as does the next one. In this paper, comma, I will explain how the economic system in the United States has declined since 2008. And then the development does the job of explaining in detail what you said you were going to do in your thesis sentences. So that's the point of the development. Because the introduction, you tell your reader what the paper will include, as well as any other background information that explains the subject that you've chosen. But then the development section, you reflect that extensive research that you've done about your subject. So the more in-depth you are in the development section, the better. Now let me tell you some things that you can ask yourself, some questions that will help you in the development section. Ask yourself, what are the highlights of the material that I read? What are the most salient points? What are the major themes? What elements are most important to the current status and future growth of my subject. And that's important. That last one's really important because in your summary conclusion, you'll get into that in even more detail, the current status and, and future growth. Another question, what things made the greatest impression on me as I did my research? Which of these reflect what I learned in class? you want to incorporate that material as well. What have I learned from my research? And here's an important one. What have I learned that changed my opinion? And if so, why? What did I learn that spoke especially to me? So you want to take all that information that you got through your research and bring it to yourself. You want to bring yourself into it because that's your summary conclusion. You are going to then take that information and give some opinions about the current status and future growth of your subject. So before I get into the summary conclusion, I want to stress something about the development section. It's really important to write in your own words in this section. Where a lot of writers fall down is that they'll give a sentence of their own and then they'll have three, four, five, six sentences that are taken directly from one of their sources. They'll just reprint the quote. And then they'll have another sentence or two of their own, then the same thing. And, and that's the pattern. That isn't what you want to do. We want you to give a paraphrase of your source material in your own words. We don't want you to just quote. Digest it and yeah. then speak it out. Yeah, exactly. You can use some quotes. It. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Internalize is good. Yeah, 
you, you can use some quotes, but make sure they're no longer than one or two sentences and use them sparingly. Yeah, it's what, what, what percentage of, of line time would you say for quotes? Gosh, um, I would say 5%, really, yeah. that's, that's all. Because the point is, or less. yeah, or less, yeah. the point is we want to know what you think, what you've learned in your own words. That's the crux of it. You may have read everything by Mahatma Gandhi. Yeah. And you've internalized it. Well, you can refer to, you know, honor this person that, you know, you learned from, but if you know it that well, say it in your own words. Yeah. It'll be more effective in your own words because that will... It's your own thoughts. It's your own thoughts, it's your own it's, thoughts it's, right. You know, it's originality and it doesn't border on plagiarism. <laughs> yeah, that, that's very important too, yeah. yeah. Um, and this is also related to um, the development. Please avoid footnotes in the body of your text. Yeah, I said no footnotes for this. Just yeah. because. But in, in general, though, uh, footnotes used to be, the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the standard where you would have a page and then you have this much footnotes below this much of the text. I mean, that, yeah, it was supposed to look really scholarly to have a lot of footnotes, but... This was back, you know, and I, I think it's like somewhere at the end of the 1800s. Into the 1900s, is, early 1900s. when this yeah. became intellectually fashionable, I guess you could say. Yeah, it did. But it sucks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, well, and, and the reason it sucks is because the reader has... It, the, the flow is broken for the yeah. reader because you have to go from the text to the bit to the footnote, the you know, bibliography, mm -hmm. the explanation, and you know you just then you're like, what did I just read? I don't know. I have to start all over again. So it, it's really counterproductive. Just write out in your own words what you want to if say. It's, if it's something that's just so involved that it needs, you know. Somebody's going to want to go and Google it to find what's what. Well, then you can put it in the appendix. Yeah. As a as a note that you know, as a copious detail. Yeah. Um, but only if you think a person may have trouble, you know, grasping the whole thing from what you're presenting. Exactly. And hopefully, you, can, you know, you can say it well enough where, you know, um, that, that's why I love. You know, at least the movie version of The Big Short is because yeah. explaining how the market works. And I said, the, the, um, who's the chef? Bourdain. Bourdain. Anthony they Bourdain. Had him on there. He's explaining how they're doing these the hedge funds. And he said, yeah, you know, we have the fish. We cut the fillet, and this is the, what we serve first. But the the heads and the tails and all this other this is not this is not scrap. Oh, we throw it into the soup over here. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know? So yeah. even very complex things can be explained in very simple terms where hopefully you know, just, you know, anybody can understand it. It's just a question, you know, okay, you're, again, you have to kind of hit, pick a focus, you know? You can't say, well, this is going to be for, you know, kindergarten readers or first grade readers or anything like that. No. Okay, you know, somebody who's, you know, senior or grad student, what is the expectation of, you know, intelligibility? Exactly. Yeah. So the summary conclusion is really the make it or break it part of your paper. That's the, that's your chance to, to really shine. Because what you're doing there is you're drawing a conclusion of your own about your subject. You've digested the information, you've internalized it, as John said, and now you're going to make some original statements about your subject. You're going to say what is working, what isn't working regarding your subject. What suggestions can I make? Because 
I know about my subject now. I've got opinions. State them. Say what you think. What's working, what's not working, how can the subject grow? What should they be doing differently? Or what should they be doing at all that they're not doing? Those kinds of things. Just, just wrap it up and put a bow on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, what is the future of my subject? What, what can you project for that subject? <coughs> What, what do you see is going on? You know, those kinds of things. So, is the current approach working? If not, why not? What would be better? Those kinds of things will really make your paper jump. We'll read that and go, wow, this person really knows what he or she is talking about and has come up with some really solid um, analyses and suggestions. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what you want to do with your summary conclusion. You, you want to appear informed and thoughtful in your conclusion. You want to be informed. Yeah, be, yeah. not appear. Here. Yeah, no, okay, all right. As Yoda be. said, there is no try, only do or not do. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. So what we're going to be looking at when, when we assess the papers, John Grading and me consulting, is we're looking for the content. Is it, is it solid? Is it, is it well researched? For clarity, is it clear? Do we, can we understand it? And the way you present it. You know, is it impassioned? Is it informed? Is it enthusiastic? And then we also look to see if the writer has followed the instructions, you know, the directives that John has given you. And, you know, then I look at the text to see, have you written something that makes sense? Can I understand it as a non-economist? Uh, is your grammar and sentence structure <coughs> correct? Are you not using fragments? You know, that kind of thing. And then finally, does the paper come to a strong conclusion? What do you leave us with, a bang or a whimper? We want the bang. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're looking for. Yeah. What, when I've talked to professionals outside of academia, which is probably where the vast majority of our students are going to spend their lives, um, I get, because I know I teach, you know, so they, they take their jabs at me. It's like, where are you teaching them down there? Uh, and it was like, people at the bank, you know, they, get, they hire people, you know, really good high grades and that, and they have to write a, an executive summary of something, whatever it happens to be, and it just falls flat and is intelligible and, you know, it's just... You mean unintelligible? Unintelligible. Yeah. yeah. In, in, okay. Um, <coughs> Jill, who's marketing, I mean, it's, what she does, she hires people um, that can write with the writing sample because it's so easy to fake writing samples nowadays. And she gives them like 90 days and has them write a whole bunch of things during that 90 days to see if they really have it. And if they don't, they're out the door. Okay? Um, I do a lot of work for attorneys and they like to pick on me anyways just because I'm an economist and they're attorneys, so that's what they like to do. Uh, but the comment I've gotten is like, we're hiring people out of law school that are incapable of writing a complaint, any kind of legal brief, <coughs> you know, what is going on, you know, and, they say, and a lot of these attorneys, you know, kind of grew up in, you know, in the age when writing was still a valued commodity or something, I'm not sure. Um, but it's frustrating. I mean, they feel like they have to sit down and 
reteach people how to write within their profession after they've gone through three years of professional school and should know better by then, but they don't. And they, you know, it, it creates a, a lot of frustration and it creates uh, a lot of people not lasting in positions that they get because simply, you know, that communication <coughs> stuff isn't there. And even in like more quantitative areas. I mean, Alfred Marshall, famous economist, right, uh, said math is just a shorthand. Now, this is a guy that we respect as being sort of the father of classic, neoclassical economics um, and really kind of bringing math into the field of economics along with people like <coughs> Fisher and others. But he said, yeah, no, it's just shorthand. You know, you, you go your ideas down mathematically, and then when you have it, you sit down, you write it, and explain it so other people can understand it. And, you know, hopefully your goal is to get to where you can just take and throw the math away because it's explained so well in the prose that you don't really need the math or just put it as, you know, the footnotes or the appendix or something where somebody wants to go through that way, so. Um, and you can make yourself even more valuable in your job if you get the reputation of, of being that person to whom the boss can come and say, would you take a look at this, um, you know, before I send it out, you know, or, or if, you can, if you can write something that, that can go out without correction, you know, with, or with minimal correction, I mean, that, that gives you a real leg up. And, and I know that because I was that person at Gale Research. You know that people would come to me and say, "Would you rewrite this for me, or you know, write this and send it out?" And you know, and that's that's how I got to <coughs> do what I do. Uh, but you can do it too, and this is this is this is how. So I want to give you a couple of things that you can you have use. With PhDs. Too. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I did. Yeah, and they some of them. Didn't write that that well, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but, and they're working at a publishing company. And they have a PhD you know, in so, English. Or yeah, they had a PhD in English. Yeah, and so it's like you wondered, okay, how did they do this and yeah. not know how to dot an I or cross a T? You know, it's kind of surprising sometimes. But sometimes, yeah. yeah, but you know, it, it is what it is. But I, I want to give you some suggestions for things that you can do, some specific things to help. Uh, bef help you before you turn in your papers. First of all, run your paper when it's done through spell check, grammar check, uh, or whatever word function you have. You will be amazed at what jumps out at you uh, so if you well, do Usually that. automatic yeah. in the newer versions, but you know, even so, I mean, people will just ignore the little color line mm -hmm. underneath words and that, and or like under a whole sentence and you know, oh, it looks okay to me. Yeah, right, yeah. right, exactly. Or you'll have a word like their, T-H-E-I-R, like, you know, like like their classroom versus T-H-E-R-E, -E, like I'm going over there and people will just see it and they'll say, oh, well, it's, it's fine. But it's not or, the or same. It doesn't pick it up because of the context it's used. Right. The, the computer doesn't recognize subtleties of the language. And so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Also, John has given you information about the videos that he and I have done. Watch those videos because they will go into even greater detail than what we're doing in the seminar today about the specifics. Of writing and if you apply uh, that to your paper that will underscore what we've done today but it'll also give you some new information also read your paper aloud before you turn it in you will just be blown away by the things that jump out at you because if you stumble on a word while you're reading it aloud the person reading it silently will definitely stumble on the same word or phrase. So read your paper aloud, either to yourself or to, to somebody else. And if you do it to somebody else, that'd be really good because that person could say, I don't get that. 
What did you mean by that particular thing, by that statement? And then you can go back to it and revamp it to make it clearer. There's a whole playlist right here, which is writing tips for economists and others. Uh, and, oh, I did one with just Gary speaking, yeah. and I broke it down into individual topics, make it easier. And then uh, in our urban economics class last fall, we sat and did one of these kinds of things, and I edited it down a little bit more. So that's on there. There's a bunch of stuff, okay? So it's all there. Just we don't want to go through a whole tutorial on, you know, commas and things no, like no. that today. But it's there if you need it, okay? Um, Okay, another thing is if you're if, if in, you know, writing in, um, in English is difficult for you, English isn't your native language, or you're just you know not that experienced of, of a writer, take your paper to the Wayne State Writing Clinic, or have an English major look at it, you know, read it over before you turn it in. That will really help because I've I've seen a lot of papers over the years where the content is really good. The person has done a lot of really good research, has written about it thoroughly in the development section, the paper, but there's so many errors, there's spelling errors and grammatical errors and fragments and anything else you can think of, and it just brings down the quality of the paper. So you don't want to be one of those people who turns in a paper like also, that. Also, the writing clinic gets backed up as you get closer to finals, and it's almost impossible to get in. So either line something up beforehand with them, or you know, it's well, just how much do they charge? Huh? How much does they charge? They charge. How much do they charge? Do they? Um, I, 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 I don't know. Oh, no, 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 me? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't I can't really do that because I'm I'm going to be. Yeah. Consulting, and, but you know, afterwards. Afterwards, <laughs> yeah. if it's something you want to put in your portfolio, you know, to show people professionally, yeah, by all means. Oh yeah, yeah. definitely. It, he'll give you the academic rate. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. And you can just uh, talk to John. He'll give you my contact information. Yeah, I'd be happy to Tom, work with you. Tom, when you get to the point of the dissertation, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Keep his number. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Be work happy out, to work, work with out you. something with him. Um, you know, uh, I started with 12 in our group, and only five finished, and five struggled, with the other four struggled, I was the first one done. Why? A part of it, every day, my editor was my wife, who was an English major, so she did like, you know, the day-to-day -day kind of thing, but Gary would be in once a week for, what, a year and a half? Yeah, yeah. Working with me, you know, and putting the whole thing together. And it helps, it really does. Because I didn't know anything about his subject, so I had to <laughs> say to him, okay, what does yeah. this mean? You know, because it was very esoteric to me, uh, even though it was very interesting. You know, so John had to explain it, and then I'd say, all right, that's it, right there. Now I get it, put that in your paper. And that's what he would do, and it, you know, he had the, so he had ultimately the combination of the more esoteric subject matter, but the clarity of the writing. So that, yeah. I think that's what really... I, I, I picked some of that stuff up from um, Alan Goodman, too, as well, because Alan was my advisor who would, and he was a gem. You know, I, I heard so many horror stories of, like, you give somebody some pages, and a month later you get them back in your dissertation. Alan, three-day turnaround. That's pretty yep. amazing. I mean, really. it's truly amazing. Yeah. And he would say things like, here, this is not this hard to understand. Why don't you put a sentence in that says, this means that. Uh, he just, will correct himself. Huh? Yeah. I said, he will correct the uh, paper. That's oh, good. Yeah. That's really yeah. good. Because I have a for urban uh, policy, and uh -huh. you know, I have to do a 15 day paper for it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's he good. Before I, um, I turned to anything, like, you need to fix this, you need to fix yeah. this. Hey, I, wow. I, I apprenticed That's with cool. him. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And Gary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, now, another thing. A lot of writers are, are all over the map on their papers. Their papers lack focus. You know, the information is good, but it's some of it's over here, some of it's over here. It's just not connected. So you want to join your material thematically, make sure it follows, make sure it flows. You know, use that inverted pyramid that we talked about earlier. And you want to explain. You know, don't just give a thumbnail sketch because you know your subject. But I don't, and maybe even John doesn't as well. You know, so you want to explain your points thoroughly. Don't just give a little tiny explanation and drop it and not finish it. You know, give the full thorough explanation. That would really help. Not too long. No. But you know, just long enough to make it clear and concise. That's that's why the editing is important. I mean. You're limited to ten pages, nine and a half minimum, ten and a half maximum. Okay, right. because it's too easy, especially in economics, to just kind of go on and on and on, and really not really crystallize and make it very concise. And that's a problem that economists have. You know, my wife tells me that all the time. I talk like an economist, and I just kind of ramble on about this and that. And yeah, I'm sure it's true. <laughs> but we're all like that. I mean, it's ingrained in our cult. This is part of the enculturation in economics, is to become like this. It's kind of scary, isn't it? That is, yeah. That is, yeah. So we, because we, you know, economics is not like this very narrow, it's, it's like, Anything in life or the universe has to do with economics, and so we tend to, you know, reaching all over there. And at the same, so when we're trying to explain something, we don't necessarily do it as concise as we may need to. So there, there is our challenge is to take that whole big universe and get it down into like you know, a small piece like that that is relatable. That, that's well said. I definitely agree with that. And I think knowing you for as long as I have and working with you, you've been, you've, you're achieving that goal because you are now able to focus and center and give information clearly and, you know, it's... Day by day. Yeah, I, it's good. I get it. It's good. So, it's a never-ending story. <laughs> of course. So what you want to do ultimately is to impress your readers with the mastery of your topic your, of, and your approach, your thoughtful reflection on your subject, and giving those reflections that are original, well-considered, and well-written. So that's it in a nutshell. The master of your, of your topic and the reflections are original, well-considered, and well-written. So now I want to give you some specific examples of errors that I have seen in term papers over the years and how to avoid them. Mm. We've seen lots of them. <laughs> yeah. The first is people don't use commas or they use them, they overuse them. The best way to approach commas is to use what's called a serial comma. That's S E R I A L. It's not cereal like breakfast cereal. And it's also known as the Oxford comma. Yeah, or right, yeah. exactly. And cereal comes from series, so it's a series of commas. So if you have more than two items in a sentence, you separate them with a comma. So if I said, I'm going to be giving my paper to John, comma, Julie, that's his wife, comma, and Marsha, that's my girlfriend. There, I've got a comma after John and a comma after Julie because there's three people in that sentence. Before so, the and. Yeah, before the and. Yeah, that's the Oxford comma. Yep, so you want to do that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people aren't doing it anymore, but it, it, it leads to people misconstruing things. It like, does, like, a lot. like for, yeah. for example, um, I threw a party and 
I invited two hookers, Bill Clinton and George Bush. Now, where you put the commas can cause that to have a totally different meaning than what you may be intending, or not. <laughs> ideally, the comma comes after hookers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ideally, yeah. But you better so. put one after the first president's name. Well, I was going yeah. to say, you only invited two people to your party. There you go. Yeah, it would yeah. seem like that. You're right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> two hookers, comma. Bill Clinton and George yeah, Bush. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't go. have that comma before the end, that kind of really is offsetting. Very much so. <laughs> yes. And, but then the, the converse is true, that people overuse commas. Yeah. Like, for example, um, if I said, this seminar is being facilitated by John and me, a lot of people will put a comma after John. But there's no reason for it because there's just the two yeah. of us. Oh, they'll you put know? this seminar, comma, is being yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. They'll do that too. For like sure. Wherever I want to take a breath, I'll put a comma there. So I, you know, no, no. No, no. If just you take a breath, take a breath, but don't, don't put the comma there. Mark it. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just remember you use the serial comma with, you know, if there's more than two things, that's when you put that extra comma in. So that, that really helps. And it also helps to put a comma in after an introductory phrase. Like if you say, however, comma, I will be blah, blah, blah. You know, you want to put that comma in after however, or like I said, the thesis sentence in this paper, comma, I will demonstrate. You want to put that comma after paper. Don't just run on between paper and I. Put the comma in there. And in the formal writing that we do in the field, you know, we have a lot of those little mechanical thing in this boom, I will and we don't talk like that, you know, socially, but yeah, it's a formality, so I'm making sure that you use those formalities correctly and yeah, we're whether to put a comma there or not is important. Yeah, because your documents are professional. They're sophisticated. They're they're up here, you know, they're they're intellectual documents. It's a practice. So this yeah. is the practice part of all this is growing professionally and we all are constantly growing in our writing and communication and, and knowledge I mean it's a never ending kind of thing exactly. um, you know just because you get a PhD doesn't mean you know anything that's true now another it's a thing starting point oh, excuse me. not an ending point <laughs> yeah right okay another thing to, to watch out for starting sentences with and to, T-O, and but. Skip and entirely. Just launch into yeah. the declarative sentence that, that you know, with the subject. Um, and then but, yeah, instead of to, say in order to. Yeah, even uh, within the sentence or something, rather than just connecting to, pa 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 pa. Yeah. Think should it sound better as in order to because it, it sometimes it can get very blurry if you don't sometimes it doesn't seem to matter that much but it's a good habit to wherever you're going to use the word to ask yourself should there, there be an in order in front of that exactly okay and then don't use but but instead say however comma yeah. Oh, within the sentence. You yeah. Oh, of course. But never starting. Starting it, starting it is amateurish and it's not professional. No. And it's like you get a decent editor somewhere that's going to you know, be responsible for publication. They just go. Uh, yeah, definitely. Now, if you interview somebody for your paper, you want to make sure that you put the name of the person in the paper and what title the person has, and also when you interviewed that person. And you, uh, in your bibliography, you also want to put that information. It doesn't necessarily have to be real long. It no. It be, you know, Joe Schmo, comma, CEO of blah, blah, blah. Right, so, that's right. Like, now, like referring to 
Adam Smith. Everybody knows who Adam Smith is, right? Well, which Adam Smith is a number of people. I mean, look in the phone book, there's a lot of Adam Smiths. Yeah. You know, so, uh, 17th or 18th, 18th, 18th. century, in, uh, actually Scottish Dutch. economist. Exactly. That's all I have to say. That's yeah. enough. Right? That's enough. Don't give, have to give his life story. Right. Okay. Now, dates. Like if you've got the 1920s, the 1990s, the 2000s, you don't need an apostrophe in there. It's just 1990 small s, 1920 small s, T O O O small s. Really commonly, a real common mistake. Yeah. And you see it not only in papers, but also in the print. And that's where people, we get a lot of this stuff from reading a newspaper, a magazine, and they'll have things like that. Oh, it's in there, it must be correct, but yeah. it's not. Ads, a lot of ads, you'll see that. Yeah. And that, like, ad can be beautiful, but there's all these errors like that in there. That, mm -hmm. And to me, that really brings them down. And the same uh, is true, you it, don't want it possessors. the in, rest of us because we think this is good writing because it's in a you know national exactly. national publication. And, that's you true. Know, so we should be emulating that. No, that that's a very good that's, point. That, it used to be you could, and it was a good model, but uh, no. yeah, not anymore. Not anymore. And the, the same is true. You don't want to use a possessive, you know, the apostrophe s when you've got CEOs, DVDs. Mm -hmm. CDs, it's the same thing. It's CEO small s, DVD small s. There's no apostrophes in there. You know, in fact, in terms of possessors in general, in informal writing and academic level writing, you know, rather than saying Adam Smith's apostrophe s book, better to say the book by Adam Smith. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. And do it that way, and don't use possessives because it's, it's less formal. Okay. Absolutely. And anyone who's going to be doing like a you know a thesis or a dissertation, that's one of the things you just want to avoid. Get get used to not doing that if you if you do it. Yourself. Yeah. Now, if you if you have a quote from one of your sources, or you're quoting somebody, can interview, you want to keep the period or the question mark, or whatever the, um, the exclamation point, whatever the last thing is in the sentence, within the quote mark. You don't want it outside of that quote. Mm -hmm. A lot of people make that mistake. Punctuation within quotes, punctuation outside of parentheses. Right. That's the exactly. rule. That's the rule. Yep. And, uh, it's, unless it's a whole complete sentence within the parentheses in your period. Yes. Other than that, no. Punctuation outside parentheses within quotes. And now, that's abused. A lot. A lot, yeah. Yeah. That's why we mentioned it. Now, if you have a URL, which I'm sure you will, mm -hmm. uh, please, please, please don't just have the, you know, the, just uh, the simple URL, just www dot whatever, without explaining the rest of the information. If there's an author, if there's a so you know yeah. a, a, a magazine source or uh, you know somebody mm -hmm. speaking, whatever, if you know, it, give the yeah. full information. If it's a specific point from a specific page, just don't give da 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 dot com go slash da, da, you know whatever. If somebody were to Copy that, paste it in, it would take them exactly to where you want them to see. Right. Okay. Again, they say, like, yeah, oh, and it, and people, it, it, it got bad in the academic writing and dissertations, uh, and it may still be in many places, but where, you know, oh, you cite the book, it's in this person's book. Well, where in the book? So yeah, and it's, it doesn't hurt. You're copious, and it's in this book. This edition, translated by this person, and 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 it's the edition of 
That's probably enough. I mean, some people will go as far as saying which paragraph, but that's more legal documentation. Yes. See that, you know, because you have to take somebody down to something very quickly where they just have that so they you know, find that. That's why legal documents, uh, like especially transcripts of, of um, uh, testimony in that will have all the lines numbered so you can just say page 25, line 15. It doesn't have to be that deep, but you know, at least you know a page number going that that far. But so somebody find it. You know, oh, I got the wrong editions. Uh, but oh, there it is. Okay. Another thing that writers do correctly and incorrectly quite often is to include split infinitives. That's where you've got the word to. And then they have some some other information before the verb, like for example, uh, I would say instead of to more fully understand, it should be to understand more fully. That you've got the word to, you've got the word understand, then you've got more fully the adverb that follows it. Yeah. Don't stick adverbs in between the to and the verb. Keep, keep the two and the verb together, and if you have any helping verbs, like I have gone, keep the helping verb, verb and the main verb together, and then put the adverbs or other things on the outside. Yeah. Okay, that's just basic rule of thumb, right? But you'd be surprised at how many yeah, people keep your, don't keep, yeah, do that. Keep your verbs yeah. together. Yeah, that's And always point. look for that, and if it looks like, oh, I got, a to or a helping verb and something like that. Okay, move it. Find the best. Sometimes end of the sentence, sometimes just immediately following the verb. Whatever seems to work. Kind of rule of thumb on this. Yeah. Now you're going to have at the end of your paper a work cited page, mm -hmm. you know, or bibliography, whatever you want to call that. You can use whatever style you want, MLA or Chicago Same Manual that. style, but please make sure that you include the author of a, of a source, the, the title, the publisher, and the publication date. Those four elements. So author, title, publisher, and pub date. And you know, just look, look at a you know academic book that has these in the back, and you see the format. It will help you. And when you have a book title or a magazine title that you're including. Put those in italics. Mm -hmm. They never go in Roman type, they're always italics. Right. Now, John referred to Adam Smith, you know, 19th, I mean, uh, 18th century Scottish economist. Use that as a rule of thumb for anybody you include in your paper. Because I or your grandma or whomever reads the paper generally won't know the people whom you're referring to. Yeah. So just put, like, for example, Stuart Rosenthal, a, prof a professor of economics at Wayne State University, or... If they're contemporary. Yeah, if they're contemporary, yeah. If they're not contemporary, then when were they? Where were they? And what were they? Yeah. You know what I'm that, that's good. Yeah, so when, that's good. where, and what. Now, if they're contemporary, you can get what I'm just saying. Where and what? Right. Economists at MIT. No. Yeah. Right. If they're not American, it probably would help to say that they're not. You'll say yeah. English or Israeli mm -hmm. or whatever. Now, um, if you have words that modify a noun, for example, 30 year loan, mortgage backed securities, there's hyphens in there. The hyphen. This is, 30 this is full of it, and you can't trust the editor who did this book. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yep. So you want 30 hyphen year alone, and all 30 years joined together, and mortgage backed. There's a hyphen between mortgage yeah. and backed because they're they're modifying securities, modifying loan. Otherwise, so, it gets very confusing. Say so a mortgage backed security. Yeah. Back security, what's the mortgage related to? In, you know, it, it, 
when you connect it, or a 30 year. In some books, you do get the hype. They, 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 some of them don't have to have it. I yeah, know, but right. you're right. Some of them books, when they're reading Dr. Bell's, yeah. it has it, and some of them when reading it, it doesn't. I know, yeah. Yeah. I know. This, so this is, this is because it's, it's otherwise, you know, you look, 30 year <coughs> bonds. Well, 30, do you have 30 bonds? 30 year bonds? Yeah, yeah. A little hyphen makes all the difference. It just makes it crystal clear. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. And like, you know, like I said, a lot of the textbooks are out there, and whether it's edited like well or not right has to do more with the publisher and their so budget. They didn't hear. Oh, okay. Some of them they don't do it. Well, okay, now yeah, if it's if, with a Y, a uh, word with a Y, you don't. But yeah, oh, here, see, mortgage, right yeah, there, mortgage right backed yeah, security. That's oh, it's right, yeah, right there? It's right there. Wow, yeah, yeah, about that. Yeah. 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 So then, <laughs> okay. yeah, they don't do it in a lot of the books. Cause then we, oh, Alan um, Kleiner, okay, he's yeah. a good author, too. So yeah, he is a good author. Okay. Yeah, we had to read this for this week. Use this text four years ago. Wow. All right, here's a big one. Saying which. W-H-I-C-H, when you mean that, T-H-A-T. Everybody does Tough this. One. Yeah, and, and here's, here's how you, you know what to use. Use which when you mean one of many. Use that when you mean the only one in question. Let me say that again. Which equals one of many, that equals the only one in question. For example, this term paper, comma, which is one of 30, comma, is very good. So I'm using which because there's one of many, which is one of many, mm -hmm. as opposed to this one. The term paper that I will be writing will get an A. So it refers to the only term paper in question, the one that you will be writing. Mm -hmm. See the difference there? Think of it this way. I was just watching Anna and the King of Siam on Turner Classic Movie last night. Now, he had many wives and concubines, so if he were to say, you know, um, he wouldn't say, that is my wife. He would refer to, you know, which is one of my wives, right? right? Exactly. Or I can say, this. That is my wife, because I have one. There you go. That's good. All right, another big one. Don't write loose, lo I mean, excuse me, <laughs> uh, when you mean loose, and don't write loose, when you mean lose. A lot of people do that. They'll put, the stock market will L-O-O-S-E lots of money this year. No, if something's loose, you know, it's going to fall down, right? It's going to, it's going to. I, I yeah. don't know where this popped up, but it has been showing up, or did for a while in uh, financial business literature. Yep. I, I don't know if 